Welcome back to the HS Arena Invitational. We are whittling down our players here. Just three left, two semifinalists and one finalist. I'm your host, Calum Leslie, and with me again is Sotol to bring you the second semifinal between Eloise and Two Beers. Wait for the winner of this is a, a formidable matchup in the final with 6 0. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, they've got a formidable challenge ahead of them in the final, but first they've got to overcome this hurdle. And I think this is a really interesting matchup. You have uh, a player who's been around for a long time in the Chinese scene and is obviously very well known as a personality, but doesn't have that defining tournament performance yet to her name in Eloise. And then you have a completely brand new player in Two Beers, who we've we've never seen before in a major tournament, but has really impressed in this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just pretty much echo what you said. You know, Eloise is looking to just take that one extra step, where Two Beers is almost looking to like leap an entire flight of stairs in one go, right? Go from zero to sixty in 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 one go and just. No one knew who he was before this tournament, but if he can win a tournament with this caliber of player pool, that immediately puts him on the map as a, as a big high-level threat in Hearthstone. Absolutely. So looking at the lineups for these two players, we have uh, from Eloise the Warrior, Paladin, and Druid with our Hunter band. And Hunter, Druid, Warlock for two beers and the Paladin band. So no uh, Hunter band, which we speculated Eloise might target because of the tech. Uh, Eloise's, yeah, Eloise's Hunter is banned. So that's one of the potentially bad matchups against Two Beers Hunter. But I feel like Two Beers might have just got the best of that purely on having his Hunter left up. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, the cards like um, Dreadscale and Harrison Jones mm. aren't going to hit, for example, too hard against the Druid. Um, although, is, is Eloise playing the, the face Druid? I don't actually remember off the top of my head. My memory's appalling. I <laughs> I'm not sure. We'll have to wait and see. Yeah, so I mean, like things like Dreadscale could obviously do a lot more work against the face druid than the than the mid range druid, but Harrison Jones is obviously going to be a whiff. Um, so maybe Eloise isn't too scared of leaving the hunter up. I, I certainly don't think this is a decision made out of ignorance. I'm sure she's seen the deck at this point, understands what it's teched against, understand what it's aimed to be, and she's made her decisions fully with that in mind. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm I'm kind of with with you here. That hunter being up definitely seems to line up pretty well against a couple of the decks that Eloise is bringing. Yeah, I mean, I, ju I just also feel like because he got two wins with it against such an established player and you saw it just do these crazy things, I'd almost just be like, no, I'm just going to take that out of the equation. Just ban it out of fear, yeah. Just reactionary yeah. ban, just get rid of it. And also just because it made it made two beers, it's obviously a deck he's really comfortable with. He's worked on it a lot. It feels like the, his favorite deck maybe out of his lineup, just on feel, I would say. So yeah, just uh, ban that out. But instead, she's targeting the... Uh, Targeting the Paladin, which again you can't you can't say that that's uh, necessarily a bad right. choice as well. That was the deck he got the third win with again against Strife Crow, and we've talked all weekend about how strong Paladin is. Yeah, we've sat here for two and a half days advocating for people to ban Paladin, and then we get someone banning Paladin. Oh, you should have banned the Hunter. Like apparently we're just impossible to please. But yeah, looking at the Paladin ban, you can't um, you can't have too much issue with that. Obviously, Pally overall has been the powerhouse deck of the tournament. Um, we're just looking specifically at Two Beers lineup and saying that he's been pretty successful with the Hunter, and the Hunter seems to line up to do nice things against, uh, you know, some classes that have both some one health minions and some weapons th across the board. So, yeah, tough to say, tough decision. I imagine it was a tough consideration for Eloise, but she's just chosen to. She probably came into this tournament, you know, with a strategy to say, all right, we'll probably just ban Paladin. And she's decided to stick with that. Yeah, I mean, we haven't seen Eloise uh, very much on the broadcast in this tournament, but we see that she is playing the Grim Patron Warrior, or a version ah. of the new Grim Patron Warrior, which is very interesting. One of the few other players to do so. Interesting. And Two Beers is going straight into that Hunter. Very, very interesting indeed. I mentioned earlier that Sixo was the only person that had kept faith with the with the Patron Warrior in this in this tournament, but I don't think we've had the opportunity to cast Eloise's Warrior yet, right? I certainly don't remember seeing Grim Patrons come out of her deck before. Uh, although, actually, now that you say it, maybe on day one. I've got an inkling feeling we may have done it on day one. Who knows? I Who knows at this notes. point? <laughs> anyway, uh, Two Beers Hand, not looking particularly rosy right now. Uh, although King's Elec can certainly do something to tie it all together, but unfortunately he's picked up a couple of the high-value minions that the Elec can hit in terms of card draw. Yeah, uh, He has both Shredders and the Lower Theb already, so um, it's just like kind of high mains and boom that have a strong potential of winning the brawl. Uh, winning the joust, sorry. We can defend our ignorance, uh, Soto. Having reviewed my notes, Great we've uh, seen Eloise on stream twice, and both times the warrior was the ban. Okay, all right. So, uh, yeah, that's okay. Yep, armor pass from the warrior player. 
Um, but I guess the interesting part of that, right, is that Two Beers has no idea that there are Grim Patrons in this deck. If it's not been exposed, unless he's uh, managed to get some inside information from someone who's played Eloise off stream, he's not going to know what to expect from this deck. So Loses the joust on that Elec. I, I can't think he's too surprised because he's playing against, uh, I guess, what he maybe thinks is more like a control warrior, but just warrior in general. Right. Uh, it's not going to be a great, uh, great one for the Elec. The Alec is a card that obviously Two Beers favors two copies of it in his deck, and some players do enjoy it, but uh, the Jouster just can be so inconsistent that a lot of people aren't putting it in the deck. Yeah, I mean, I think people are generally okay with it. The theory behind the King's Alec is that it's a nice um, it's a nice card draw sometimes, and it also just helps you dig high-value minions out of your deck, because when you do win the Joust, obviously you're most likely going to have won it on a high-value minion that you then want to have in your hand. And it just complements nicely because you'll be keeping the low value minions in your hand early. You know, you'll have your web spinners and your hornet creepers kept in the mulligan. And then you can use the Elec to then pull a higher value card to fill out that curve over the what? following turns. No. Um, so it, like when it hits, it's such a big advantage that I can understand people taking the risk of, you know, just playing Bloodfen Raptor sometimes. So the death fight is going to come down and start to deal with this board for Eloise. Uh, something we saw uh, other warrior players digging for. We haven't seen too many death spites come out today for some reason, but uh, not very good at dealing with these shredders because it's just going to leave power on the board. Not at all. There might even be some concern from Eloise that she doesn't actually want to swing this death spite at all because we see next turn in her hand is the real power turn of the Grim Patron Whirlwind to combine with the Whirlwind from the death spite and make four patrons, which. Uh, Hunter doesn't generally have a nice way to deal with, although we do see Eagle Hornbow and Quickshot in Two Beer's hand, which can start to clear that up. So if he's left with minions on the board, that strategy might not work out. And more importantly, you can't just sit around waiting while two piloted shredders beat you in the face, because that's not going to last too long. Yeah, so just Sludge Belcher coming down from Eloise, and this is the, the strength of kind of the new mid range version of the patron, is it does have these really good value minions like Sludge Belcher to come down. Double Hunter's Mark in this build of Hunter as well. Just really heavily teched out. I guess that makes a lot of sense with the Dread Scale that he's playing. Um, True, to, yeah. To play, to play the two copies of Hunter's Mark. But yeah, it's a really heavily teched out Hunter deck. That's kind of hilarious. We thought that the Dread Scale was just sort of tech against classes with lots of one health minions. But when you play Double Hunter's Mark, it's actually tech against like things like Handlock as well. Absolutely. And I would love for two beers here to be a little bit insightful because the temptation here might be to use the quick shot. Um, but I would love for him to hold on to it because he's just seen a warrior hold on to a death fight for seemingly not a particularly good reason. You know, it, it wasn't a clean swing that turn, but it feels like you need to relieve some of this pressure and start dealing with the pilot shredders. So yeah, I love him holding on to the quick shot here because it gives him the maximum options of potentially dealing with a grim patron turn next turn. If he's anticipating grim patron. If he's anticipating Patron, then I'll be pretty impressed. Oh, that's what I'm saying. You've just watched the Warrior hold on to a Death Spite, which is a classic Patron move to try and have this sort of turn on a later turn. Um, so I think if you're really, really like attuned to what's going on, you can make that potential read, at least have it as, in, as a possibility in your head that you can hedge your bets around. Um, you, know, you see the turn comes down here, and it actually does pretty decently at clearing up this board, gets rid of both um, of the main bodies of the Piloted Shredder. If he didn't preserve some options in his hand here to start clearing out this board, you might have found himself in trouble yeah but this patron board can get completely dealt with with the quick shot and uh two beers can even refill with an animal companion if he wants yep uh so we will quick shot one we will bow down another we will trade into the one health one with the novice engineer trade into the other with the uh goblin auto barber and he does have nice options to refill he can also use uh Hunter's Mark instead and have a higher tempo play with Loatheb and just isolate the 3-1 patron on the board instead. Uh, it's a possible option. There's some merit on that. It's higher tempo. It's more aggressive. But I'd, uh, I'd expect we just see the, the standard clearing play here or alternatively just the ignore this board completely play and value the, the quick shot and the kill commander's game ending burst and just activate a race here. Well, this is true. I mean, how much burst is he setting on with the bowl? The hero power, kill command, and uh, quick shot next turn. That's a lot of burst. That's what, 13? I mean, it's worth noting that Hopper was just lethal there for a start. Sure. Yeah, so, you know, 4, 7, 8. If that, you know, if that 4 power had charge, you'd have 8 on board, 11 from the bow, and then 16 with the kill command. Um, so, because he was so close, like, he might have lethal on the brain and just decide to go all in here. Make killing the 3 1 patron definitely makes a lot of sense. He probably doesn't need that one damage to push himself over the line. But this racing strategy is so scary against things like Armorsmith. 
Yeah, let's we'll see if it pays off for him. Belcher is there, but I don't think there's going to be any way for Elwes to defend against this. I mean, Battle Rage hitting exactly Armorsmith and Whirlwind, does that get us anywhere? It probably does. What? Um, no. Because you'd enable a good trade on the board, you would gain four armor immediately from the Whirlwind, one more from the trade. You would have spent five mana total, still have one more. Uh, he's going to go for the card draw with Slam first. If you slam your own patron, you can then Battle Rage. Yeah, I'm I personally would have slammed the. You could have slammed your own patron there and given you an yeah. extra card from Battle Rage. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess that's viable, but he needs to be able to set up the efficient clear on the Misha here, I think is the more yeah, important thing. Yeah, she does. Um, so, yeah, I don't blame her for that at all, but it's it's a struggle. I think Armorsmith was your only out here. She really just needed to dig as hard as possible for that Armorsmith. Didn't get it. Eight damage. Well we have you covered, my friend. A second kill command. That certainly seals the amount of damage you need in your hand. Quick shot kill command hero power. It's going to be a relatively quick first win for two beers, and we're not going to see. I mean, we saw Sixo's patron doing very well earlier on in the tournament. We're not going to see the same success for Eloise as that patron is now out of here. Indeed. Big, big first win for this Hunter deck that we uh, had a little bit of suspicions might be banned, but continues to perform extremely well for two beers. Eloise is going to have to find some sort of answer with her remaining lineup. And she has Paladin and Druid available to her. We saw Paladin being a very bad matchup against this Hunter, so I don't, I'd, I'd probably favor the Druid going in, but Eloise disagrees going into the Paladin. Okay, I'm not quite... Don't quite recall what type of druid uh, Eloise is, is playing, but if it's the mid-range druid, that's just not anything I feel like I'd ever willingly queue into a mid-range hunter. I think mid-range hunter is just so much better at getting the early board lead, lead and snowballing, that sort of thing. So I'm no great surprise to see Eloise go with the uh, the paladin here. She's just going to try and have better luck than, uh, than the previous opponents against two beers did earlier. Yeah, I mean, with the win against the patron, it feels like two beers is in a... Pretty decent position here to sweep with this mid-range hunter. It does, yeah. I think this is probably the, the toughest matchup he has left. Um, but still, it's it's definitely winnable. He showed us that earlier in the tournament, especially if he gets into those tech cards that he's put in to, for these sorts of situations. That dread scale, the Harrison Jones can represent a lot of value um, hitting a Light's Justice or a True Silver. So definitely yeah, doable. Just... Uh, just fixing some buffering issues on the uh, the feed there. And we'll just get back into that game in a second uh, when we can get that sorted. But yeah, the mid-range hunter for two beers is going very well for I, him in the previous matches. I can tell you that he did actually mulligan into Dreadscale in his opening hand again. He has it ready for turn three if there's a potential muster for battle coming. All right. Uh, just waiting to see if we can get this sorted out as soon as possible. Uh to get you back into this game, which could be a crucial game here if two beers can take this win. And then, of course, the Druid is uh, not a great matchup either. Just trying to get that started. Okay, looks like we're back into the game now. There we go. There we go. All uh, right. Just, just so you're all aware, by the way, because people are, are spamming pre-recorded in the chat. The, the tournament isn't pre-recorded. Uh, the tournament is live. We're casting off a 15-minute delayed feed, which is uh, fed through YouTube, which is why you're seeing the YouTube buffering stuff. Uh, so it's not pre-recorded, it's just a separate feed that we're casting off to put, put out the Twitch feed, so there you go. Yeah, that, that sounded really confusing, even to me, and I know... It's not pre-recorded! I know, I know what's... It's not pre-recorded, that's it. That's all I need to say. It's not pre-recorded. I'm quite willing to put a shoe on head if necessary. I'm totally yeah. not, don't hold me to that. So I'll say he put a shoe on his head. <laughs> So you heard it. Anyway, as I... Yeah, you did mulligan into the red skin. Yeah, as I spoiled for you earlier, because this tournament is, of course, pre-recorded. <laughs> <laughs> dread scale was found in the opening mulligan for two beers, which, as we know, is crushing against uh, Muster for Battle. We saw it do insane work against Strife Crow's Paladin earlier on in the tournament. Um, but no Muster for Battle in Eloise's hand. She has a different type of uh, Paladin opening where you get the Secret Keeper, you get a bunch of uh, secrets to spiral it out of control, and you get kind of the, the old-fashioned Undertaker effect. Yeah, interesting she didn't go with the the coin into the secret. I can see why when you've got two, when you've got double two-drop, you might have wanted to even coin into the two-drops. But if you're going to put the Secret Keeper, why not coin out the secret as well? I think we might end up with a two-drop coin secret next turn. 
Um, okay. It's, 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 it's essentially the same thing, unless you plan to play both secrets over the course of these first two turns. The, the secret keeper still gets buffed immediately. You still get to attack for the same amount of damage. Um, it's not like buffing it immediately protects it from remo removal, because it still dies to quick shot either way. Um, so I think she might choose this turn to accelerate and use the coin here just to pick up a nice trade. Yep, you can see that uh, Two Bears was looking at the Hunter's Mark there, maybe to try and set up for the Dread Skill next turn, but I don't think you need to play that because I... it's zero mana. Yeah, mm. I think the Hunter's Mark was just to deny the trade here. So you reduce it to one. So when one secret is played, it only goes up to a 2-2, two -two, and then it can't sure. trade for value against the um, against the Mad Scientist. But the flip side of that is that it doesn't matter if the Secret Keeper's left lying around with one health because you have Dread Scale as your follow-up anyway. So he just decided, quite rightly, I think, just to hold on to mm. the Hunter's Mark for some value later. Because if his uh, Dread Scale sticks, he can just use that Hunter's Mark essentially as an assassinate the next turn. Yeah, zero mana assassinate sounds pretty good. I'd play that coin. Sounds reasonable, right? I mean, we already have a two mana assassinate in the game. It's called Sap. It's pretty good. It's not really assassinate because you can replay it. Shush. Hunter's Mark's even better. In terms of tempo, it's you've killed it. Okay. That's, the, that's the important thing. Cool. Uh, so lots of three drop options for two beers. He has the Eagle Horn Ball as well as the Dread Scale. Of course, Dread Skill would take the Divine Shield off, but then just get traded into by the mini bot. So I think he might go for the bow here and just clear up the Secret Keeper. Yep. Um, see, the Dread Skill plan didn't quite pan out as he would have liked. Uh, competitive Spirit goes off, only hits one minion, but it's a pretty nice minion to hit. Divine Shield 3 3 is now a pretty juicy minion, but it's um, staring back into what is probably a freezing trap. He has double freezing one snake. There we go. Confirmed freezing. Yeah, anytime you can uh, buff up your Divine Shield minions with like a Blessing of Kings or a Competitive Spirit or Avenge, it always feels pretty good because you're demanding so much more resources and potentially so much more damage onto your opponent. Absolutely, and this is a really appealing board to get a Repentance down on. This is one of the most difficult secrets in the deck to get value out of. It's one of the, the secrets that some people choose to cut, some people choose to play only as a one-off for the full uh, secret package with Mysterious Challenger, but this board, a Death Rattle minion and a Divine Shield minion... Oh, sorry, this is Repentance. I was talking the entire time about Redemption because I'm an idiot. <laughs> uh, but still, Excellent. decent value. Sets up a really good trade with the Haunted Creeper into a Piloted Shredder. And, uh, yeah... There's, there's the redemption. See, I again, I'm just casting from the, the pre-recorded feed, right? I just knew the redemption was coming. Yeah. Do you think we can just milk that meme for a bit longer, Callum? No, I think we're probably just making things worse at this point. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so not a really good way to deal with this mini bot for two beers on the other side. But the cog hammer, it's kind of difficult for Eloise because if it hits the creeper, that's really good value. But if you waste the extra divine shield on the uh shielded mini bot then that doesn't feel good at all so i think you probably just want to hit the mini hit the shredder here with the mini bot and then refuel the divine shield yeah certainly seems reasonable there's a good chance you get to chop down whatever comes out of the shredder like the, like the puddle stomper so yeah cog hammer lines up here really nicely he gets his three three divine shield back looking pretty good for eloise and plays the redemption indeed redemption not the repentance yeah so two beers hasn't drawn into anything you would have liked here things like shredders or uh, i'm not sure if there's i don't i think there might be belchers in this deck or harrison jones even would be pretty great on that cog hammer just as the dread skill for minion damage and board so we might see the dread skill hunters mark come out here just to clear the board but then the redemption hits and that's that doesn't feel good yeah, you're scared. You you are scared. After that, the you you've ruled out Noble Sack. You've already seen a competitive spirit. You are terrified that this is going to be the redemption. In which case, the Dread Scale Hunter's Mark play is going to get punished extremely hard because of the Divine Shield two one that comes back that just picks up a free trade. Um, so Eloise managed to set up a pretty difficult situation here for the Hunter to navigate. Um, and she only has to fill in one turn or so before her big power turn with the Mysterious Challenger. And wow, hero power pass turn from, from two beers. Turning down any option to deal with that shielded mini bot. Quick shot was of course a viable option as well, but he's just really, really scared of that um that redemption popping on the shielded mini bot. Mad Scientist is a minion, and uh Two Beers has been looking for minions for the last couple of turns, but once again getting that burn into his hand. We saw this against Strife Crow that he drew the burn really early and then drew into his minions when he maybe wanted to draw into a little bit more burn and was able to close that out, but 
it's a pretty difficult up against a, another aggressive mm. deck like the Paladin. Right. The problem that he's worked himself into here as well is that by by not confirming whether or not this is redemption, he continues to make his turns really awkward because another great redemption target has now hit the board. Um, so by not least, you know, activating the redemption at some point, he's freezing all these cards in his hand, just refusing to deal with things, and he might just decide that he's on the all-out base plan here, which um, I don't think he's going to have enough time to do, especially with the Mysterious Challenger coming into play here. Um, that does allow him to deal with the uh, Redemption a bit more efficiently, though, because now the Noble Sack will have come out, so he can use uh, get the Redemption procced on that and then start dealing with the rest of the board. But there's just a ton of damage being dealt in the meantime, and this situation he's put himself in where he's basically not allowed himself to use removal in fear of Redemption has just cost him over the course of the last two turns. He's just fallen too far behind on the board. When the Noble Sack comes out with the Hunter's Mark, can he make stuff happen with the Dread Skill? Ah! <sighs> He can make stuff happen, I'm just not quite Maybe sure it's it. enough. Um, so you'd be looking at something like Dread Scale, Unleash the Hounds, Hunter's Mark, something that's left over. Obviously, you'd be trading off your dogs, or you can Dread Scale, Kill Command, something, Hunter's Mark, something else. Uh, there's potential to reduce a significant amount of damage, but I don't think there's going to be a ball clear. If there is, it's going to be a complicated one, and it's. Uh... Yeah, definitely I mean, to figure out from this position. I guess there is potential, but he's going to take a lot of damage in the meantime. Uh, he does get to get a trap out here by procking the noble sack with his mad scientist. Um, we'll see what line he goes here. I think he does have a potential ball clear. It does mean taking some damage in the meantime, and I think we leave behind uh, a shredder drop. So not a full ball clear, but. These turns going into Paladin Secrets, into their Challenger turns, are really, really awkward to nav navigate going back the other way. So there's a Redemption, reviving the Defender. Extra 2-1 on the board is no problem for something like Unleash the Hounds to take care of, but the rest of this board is pretty intimidating. So you can hit, yeah, you, you can definitely clear up with the the Dread Skill here and just leave the Shredder drop. You can kill the 3-3 three, three with the bow. Yeah. Hunter's Mark the 9-8 and then... Uh, quick shot the 4-3 yep. and I guess hope that you get a one health minion off the shredder coming down and then dread scale the whole board Seems so there's a potential full board clear but it's yep. not not guaranteed depending on the shredder drop Elise has just got her into such, herself into such a powerful position here but that is the play we're going to see oh, he's going to looks like he's pointed this at the wrong minute he's going to end up taking one extra damage here no he decides to clear the shredder he might not clear the shredder interesting he really wants to get repeated value. I guess that means that he got the second freezing trap and not the snake trap off of his mad scientist, and he's just going to isolate this shredder and leave it uh, essentially dead to freezing trap, which makes a lot of sense too. But without the knowledge of which trap he pulled, we can't really make the reads on those plays. Uh, Tyrion is a nice draw eventually, not a fantastic draw right now. It is the snake trap, all right. Maybe he was trying to bluff. Yeah, so I then. guess he just went with the bluff, felt far enough behind that he had to do that sort of thing. But it seemed pretty obvious that the Dread Scale was going to get attacked by the Cog Hammer that turn. Um, so I don't know. It does let him get another board, uh, bow charge. And now he is threatening to push through a lot of damage with Unleash the Hounds and Kill Command. Um, but he needs to lock it up this turn or deal all of his melee damage this turn because Tyrion is going to come down and lock him out the next turn. So he needs to get himself into a position where Kill Command alone is enough to kill. Uh, so he needs to get him down to seven. So Kill Command hero power is lethal. He needs to have a beast remaining to be able to do that. So he has three, six, eight on the board. Unleash the hounds. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he can actually just unleash the hounds, hero power, go face with everything, including the bow charge. He's not dead on board. And that will put the opponent in range uh, of lethal next turn. Animal Companion is the same thing. 6, 9, 14, 6. He's now one off lethal, I believe. Uh, wait, no. Unleash the Hounds is more damage. 6, 12. No, he has lethal. He has lethal. Face with all snakes. Unless this is a noble sack, which it is. Never mind. Yeah. Yeah, he had the, she had the noble sack in hand. After the Mysterious Challenger came down, so he played the second right. Noble Sack after the Mysterious Challenger. Okay, so, so we now have four turn. dogs to go for face for eight each, ten, fifteen. So yeah, you can put him for two to two with a Kill Command in hand, um, which seems like a reasonable option. You can just put him down to uh -huh. just put him down to five and then trade the rest of your board to reduce your own chances of dying. That seems like the most reasonable play, but he's going to go for an even safer play than that. 
And that might be a mistake, because Tyrion's going to come down here, reduce the chances for uh, melee damage to go through, and he doesn't have enough with kill command and hero power. Put your faith in yeah, this feels like... Uh, we saw this against Strife Crow, that two beers went for a, a more defensive play in, using the, in going for the freezing trap rather than the hero power in the third game, and could have had lethal if, with the top deck that came off and uh, taken that series 3-0, to zero. and this may cost him here again. Hasn't set himself up for lethal here. Right. I mean, it's 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 hard to uh, to criticize the play too much because you know I made a mess at the last turn myself completely. Anyway, I didn't even notice there was a noble sacrifice in play, but a little bit timid in terms of how much damage he decided to send to face, um, how much he decided to clear, and that's left him in a really really awkward spot. It feels like he's gone kind of two half and half on his mm. play there, and not really set himself up in a great position either way. Right. Uh, so what does he have to do here? There's not too many particularly great options available to him. Eloise is going to trade, take the damage of the Leoc off the board. That makes a lot of sense. The Weblord is very low value here. Potentially, Eloise could have had lethal on the backswing from the Shredder drop. If it was a, a three attack, but it's not going to get that done. Yeah, leaving the Leoc on the board when you're so close to death is pretty terrifying, though. So I, I can sympathize with her decision to trade there. Two Beers now has to find a way. Um, all he has to do is live. Um, he's going to choose to push through here with the kill command to kill the Tyrion. And hope that just high main on its own is enough to carry this game by the looks of uh, how he's setting up this turn. I kind of like this play a lot. This is actually a really nice recovery for him, recognizing that by drawing the high main, he can now uh, represent value on the board. Six on the backswing coming from Eloise, so she has to find three more damage. And you've taken True Silver out of the equation because you're already including a weapon. Divine Favor is a pretty much a brick. It allows her to cycle for one card. That one card needs to be precisely Blessing of Kings, I believe. Yeah. I think there's anything else doesn't the get its that mysterious doesn't. challenger. Speaking of uh, Nerubal Weblord value, no mana to play it for six anyway, but slightly amusing to see it in the hand for eight. And Eloise is out of options here. That high main is just going to represent lethal the next turn, so she concedes. Yeah, the Paladin going to go down. And two beers is uh, his hunter is two now up once again. The second time we've seen this from him. Two wins with his hunter deck. Uh, if I'm six or waiting in the final, I'm probably thinking about doing this if it gets if it gets to that point. But Eloise still has the Druid, and uh, I mean, we talked in the last game about how mid-range Druid is really, really sketchy up against... Uh, the Druid is really sketchy against mid-range Hunter. Yeah, the mid-range Druid in particular, yeah. Um, I think the face Hunter, the face Druid has a better chance against mid-range Hunter, but uh, by the Wrath that is in her hand, it looks like this is just a mid-range Druid, in which case the Hunter is just able to snowball this matchup so effectively. Mad Scientist early is just so powerful if it then pulls a Freezing Trap, which then locks out the Druid Shredder and just all sorts of awful things, terrible interactions. They struggle to deal with high main. Lower Theb can, can lock out combo. The only slight saving grace for Eloise here is that Two Beers does have a couple of uh, slightly whiffy tech cards in his deck, like Harrison Jones and Dreadscale a little bit as well. But now we've seen the double Hunter's Mark as well. He can actually use Dreadscale to leverage some tempo turns against even Druid's huge minions. So Wild Growth, pretty good start for the Druid, obviously, as always. Uh, see double four drops in the hand for Two Beers. So the coin into the Mad Scientist was a bit awkward. He's going to go ahead and coin the Animal Companion, I guess, and uh, go with the bull as the follow-up. Yeah, this is interesting. Trying to get uh, ahead of the game with a big minion on board. It is successful. I guess after the Wild Growth, he didn't just want to play the Mad Scientist because it's the perfect target for Keeper of the Grove. Um, he really wants to value his, his freezing traps in this matchup, is I imagine his mentality. Uh, if you're going to win this matchup as Druid, then uh, one of the things that can really help you do that is innovate or Wild Growth directly into Keeper of the Grove to get a really huge swing on the board early. And uh, by coining out the Misha, or, you know, coining out Animal Companion and not rolling Huffer, essentially, takes that option away from his opponent. All right, so the uh, Eagle Horn Bowl to refill is an option, but it's just going to go with the Mad Scientist, it looks like. Yeah, um... Interesting. I mean, I guess he's he's saying to his opponent, if you want to play a five mana keeper of the grove, that's fine. I just wasn't going to give it to you on curve. 
Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Eloise decides to turn that down and just develop the Druid of the Claw, because I don't think she has any knowledge that you know, Double Hunter's Mark is in this deck, so uh, it was a surprise to us in the mm. previous game, so it will probably be a surprise to her as well. So the chances of, um, of Two Beers having his, his what's suspected to be a one-off Hunter's Mark in his hand at this point to make a huge tempo swing is pretty low. So I wouldn't be surprised at all just to see the on-curve play of Druid of the Claw come down here. Where shall I start? There we go. Yep, there you go. Druid of the Claw on five, just to set up the taunt. It's a very strong minion, just on its own, even not answering any threats from the board, potentially, but Pilot Shredder and the Hunter's Mark going to come down to clear it out. Don't mind this at all. Gets the secret up and uh, deals with what is a potentially difficult minion. Yeah, this turn is just absurdly swingy. You get a 4-3 on board, you deal 4 damage to your opponent's minion. I must um, and then you also get the secret in play, which can deal with your, with your druid's next minion, because you have a 66% chance of hitting Freezing Trap. In fact, a 100% chance of hitting Freezing Trap, because you have the Snake Trap in your hand. So this Keeper is uh, not going to be able to interact with the board, but it is a decent minion in the druid's deck to get frozen. He even has the option of the Force of Nature in his hand that he can use to uh, proc the Freezing Trap with a Treant. We saw the swing come back with the Keeper of the Grove and the Wrath there. Yep, pretty good. Uh, like I said at the start, Keeper of the Grove is definitely one of the cards you want to have early. Um, as time's gone on, it's, it has more utility in the game early than it does to deal with something like Savannah High Main late. Because um, as we mentioned in the game, I cast it with Firebat a little bit early. It's it's you know you can silence the six five, but it's still a six five on the board that's representing a ton of pressure. So Keeper on on High Main is usually not that useful, and you'd much rather use it to control the board early. Eloise uh, using it pretty effectively there. Two beers here, looking at lining up King's Elec perhaps with a Houndmaster. No great answer to this Doctor Boom yet. Second Hunter's Mark would be pretty fantastic in the next couple of turns just to. Deal with some of this value that's on the board. Houndmaster makes a 5-4 King's Elec, and this is a pretty intimidating board on both sides. One of them just has the Doctor Boom, and one of them has uh, three pretty powerful uh, mid range minions right now. Yeah, the King's Elec and the Snakes do allow them to have lots of good targets for the Houndmaster. It's uh, kind of generating those tokens from the Snake Trap and hitting the Houndmaster on them is always good value. This uh, Elec, which is not very threatening, 3-2 going up to a 5-4, He's able to get really good value out of these Houndmasters. He is, yeah. But yeah, you know, this is a slightly more defensive Houndmaster. You know, generally when you're you, you're trying to, even though this is a mid rangey deck, you're trying to play the aggressor with this deck. You like to play your Houndmaster with charge, essentially. You know, um, hitting it on a consolidated minion already on the board and, and pushing through the initiative with the buff. Uh, he was forced into a little bit of a defensive play that turn to protect his board from the Doctor Boom, which was the biggest threat in play. Um, but still, decent value out of the Houndmaster, but Eloise finds a nice way to clear up, isolates the Pilot Shredder on the board, looks like Two Beers is going to be forced to be a little bit defensive again, use the Quick Shot to take down this 7-7, seven, seven, which is going to lock him out of developing the high Yeah, and after pushing his opponent to 15 health or half-life, thereabouts, in quite a number of games of this Hunter's deck, it's actually Two Beers, who's staring down potential lethal with uh, Savage or top deck. And... Nope. No, second keeper. Uh, so this was Snake Trap put into play this turn by two beers. So just trying to get a bit of initiative onto the board, knowing that there's a really good value trade in play for the, the shade into the ship's cannon. If the druid chooses to go that way, at least preventing that with the with the snake trap. This is uh once again getting to see what might be my new favorite golden card animation, ship's cannon. <laughs> I don't know, it's just super satisfying. I, I really enjoy it. I hadn't even noticed it was moving. That is strangely pleasing, actually, now that you point it out. <laughs> uh, not as good as the Murloc Knight, obviously. The Murloc Knight is, of course, the, su the superior golden animation. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, Hero Power Face, Keeper Face. Looks like we're just going to activate the race here. Excellent read from Eloise that this is Snake Trap. She's already... Oh, she's actually going to choose to keep the Shade Stealth. That's interesting. Um, well, you've got it, the... Uh, when you've got the keeper, the force of nature on the backswing as well, it's coming for extra damage. You've got a lot of potential, and actually, that's going to be it, right? It's five in play. There's six from the hand. This is snake trap. It's not any sort of defensive secret. So yeah, this is just going to end the game right here. It's one over. In fact, that's well more with the living roots. Yep. Uh, with the hero, it didn't even need the hero power because of the shade growth. He has six on board, in fact, and the force of nature. So yeah, that's going to be it. Eloise is going to get a game back. This is uh, the same situation we saw with Strife Crow, is that the Hunter was 2-0 up, managed to get a win against it. So Hunter is going to be out of here. And Two Beers is going to have to find a win with either his Druid or his Warrior. 
Yeah, so Druid uh, or Warlock to line up against the Druid. Uh, the Warlock was Zoo, if I remember correctly. I think it's Handlock. Is it? Though it might be, like, it play... might be the Demon Lock. No, it's the Demon Zoo, yeah. It, yeah, it's, it's, it's Zoo. He played a Zoo mirror against Raven earlier in the tournament, right? I believe pretty so. Pretty sure, yes. yeah. Um, so Zoo lines up pretty well against Druid, for sure. Um, and then obviously his other option is just the uh, the Druid mirror. Uh, looks like we might be wrong. It was, no, it was in fact Handlock. Apparently it's Handlock. We're just dumb. Okay. Um, so this not really a deck that you want to be queuing into um, queuing into Druid. Druid classically very heavily favoured in this matchup. The Demon version does have a slightly stronger chance um, because of the tempo you can get, for example, of pulling a, a Malganis or particularly a Jaraxxus out of Voicaller. Um, Jaraxxus doesn't have too much utility as an actual uh, her hero form in this matchup because you just are so exposed to combo the entire time as soon as you enter Jaraxxus form. Um, so actually getting it on board as a minion from Voicaller and then taunting it up with something like Defender of Argus or Sun Fury Protector can just represent a ton of value on the board and just outvalue Druid throughout the mid-game that way. Another big benefit of having the Void Collar in this deck is the, another thing to hit on four if you're running the coin, because you can't, if you're running the coin, if you're going second, uh, you don't run the coin. You could, you would run the coin if you could, I think, possibly in some decks. <laughs> but uh, if you're on the coin, having the extra four drop, if you don't draw your Twilight Drakes, not making your Mountain Giants awkward, it gives you something else to do on turn four. Yeah, what it also allows you to do is um, use your cards freely against aggro. You can use things like uh, Dark Bombs, Iron Bee Cows, Ancient Watchers, Sun Furies, etc. in the early turns. And you still have a strong four drop that's unaffected by having a small amount of cards in your hand. You don't have to play a small Twilight Drake or uh, you, know, you don't have an unplayable Mountain Giant in your hand because you've had to fight for the board early in, in turns with your removal spells and smaller minions. So uh, Voicaller... Although you have to remove things like Sludge Belcher from your deck, which um, cre de decreases your consistency against aggro, it actually has a, a slightly different effect in allowing you to use your early game cards more efficiently and not get punished for it. All right, so we're going to see probably the coin Twilight Drake here. Um, does get punished by Keeper of the Grove with the Living Roots up, though. It does. It gets punished pretty hard by Keeper of the Grove, but there's no demon in, in the hand for the Void Caller, but you can just take the bluff here and just hope that it doesn't die, uh, which I don't mind at all. Um, the Twilight Drake is kind of overkill on this board. You don't really need a huge four attack, massive health minion when you're just defending against a couple of 1-1s. One um, so I don't mind this play, even though if the bluff does get called immediately, then he's not going to get any demon value. All right, so we'll see if this demon can come into play here we get something like uh, a Doom Guard. Nope, just another Owl, unfortunately, but yeah. uh, it's not going to be that relevant yet, but just going to see the Twilight Drake on four. I got having these double four drops when you're on the coin is uh, is a really great benefit of this Demon Handlock. Yeah, for sure. But both both hands are kind of uh, running out of steam at this point. We see in Eloise's hand, she just has a Druid of the Claw and not much else to follow it up afterwards. She does have the Big Game Hunter, which is extremely important um, to line up against things like Mountain Giants and Molten Giants from the Handlock. But double Force of Nature, a little bit clunky. Um, you'd much rather have... Uh, if you're going to have individual combo pieces in your hand, you'd much rather have the Savage Rules in this matchup than the Force of Nature's. And then a couple of Wraths not really doing a great deal right now either, so... Both of these players still looking for a couple of key options. Lower Theb is a nice play if we need it this turn. Um, but long-term prospects not looking too fantastic for either hand right now. Yeah, unfortunately, we don't have a demon in hand to enable a really swingy turn with something like uh, the Dark Bomb running the Void Collar into the 4-6 and then taunt things up. That would be a really good swing turn for, for two beers, but unfortunately, it doesn't have a demon available. All right, I think you just want to... Ooh, that's going to cost four, right? Yeah, slightly too expensive. I think you want to use the, the health of your Twilight Drake here to trade into the bear, and then just use the Void Caller to take off the 1-1. One -one. Um, yeah, you, you really want to keep this uh, Void Caller alive as long as you can, because you still are having no luck of drawing into that all-important demon. Um, hopefully, from, from Two Bears' perspective, he's just hoping that Eloise is, is too scared to pop this, doesn't have the right answers. But she does have the big game hunter in her hand. So Malganis isn't even a bad scenario for her. So I can totally see her just taking the risk of, of activating the Void Caller this turn. 
And she's going to get paid out pretty big for that, because as we can see, it's it's death rattling into nothing right now. Yeah, but there's not a lot of options on the Druid side as well. Double Force of Nature, Double Wrath, Wild Growth, Big Game Hunter. Nothing you really want to do here. I mean, I, I guess you probably just Wild Growth to ramp a little bit or cycle those Wraths. I like I like using the Wraths here on the on either target, really. You can take out the Twilight Drake, that's fine. But like I said, he, she has Big Game Hunter in her hand. Um, so she can choose to open up the, the Void Caller here. And if Malganis is inside, which is worst case scenario, she has the Big Game Hunter to finish it off. But chooses to go with the cycle option that you favored. And ooh, Malganis does come into play. So that Big Game Hunter is gonna be is gonna be useful. And Eloise has missed her window to, to kill the Void Caller for free. Yeah, very much so. It's uh, it's always a difficult decision to make when you're up against the boy caller. Is do you take the risk that your opponent does have a demon and and maybe try and get the really good value of killing that boy caller without a demon popping out, uh, or do you let it live? And the longer you let it live, the more chance there is your opponent has a demon. But if you have a demon to start with, you get punished anyway. It's it's a difficult call for sure. And I can totally understand Eloise's decision not mm. to do it because she only has the answer to Big Game Hunter in her hand. Sorry, the answer to Malganis with the Big Game Hunter in her hand. She didn't have any sort of answer to Doomguard or Jaraxxus in the oh, board. So. I can understand her not taking the risk and we do now see the Malganis come into hand. So Two Bears is going to get a bit of extra value out of this boy Caller, but the Big, uh, big Game Hunter is there ready and waiting for Eloise to tidy up anything nasty that's going to happen this turn. So does she have to reveal the shade here to trade? Yeah, it depends how long how long term her plan is with this shade. As we can see, she does have both copies of Force of Nature, so she she might be looking to use this shade as a long term investment for a for a Force Savage combo later on. Um, but this board is is starting to spiral out of her control what? because she hasn't had any proactive minions of herself really. Just uh, that one Druid the Claw in terms of her her mid game. Yeah, it's, it's not looking fantastic, so she may have to use the, the shade a little bit earlier than she might have liked here to answer back some of this board state. Hmm. Yeah, still nothing really to get going from the Druid, though. No minions that you can put down. No Ancient of Lures, no Doctor Boom. Really unfortunate. It does look like it's going to be a, a combination removal turn this turn, and Eloise is really, really thinking hard about it. Considering all her options, she's going to start out with the Force of Nature, which locks her out from using the Big Game Hunter this turn. So I imagine the Shade is staying stealth, and we are not going to attack into that boy call this turn. Uh, Alright, just going to use the Hero Power, and it uh, looks like she's planning to use the second Force of Nature for board control again next turn, quite possibly. That's a lot of resources to use for the board control with a double force of nature, but when you're so far behind in terms of uh, the threats that you have in your hand, I mean, you know playing against Handlock, you don't even need you don't need to see their hand to know that they have probably a lot of big threats available. So and you're sitting with absolutely nothing. Sure. Um, I think the, what this play also does is introduces the fear of Force of Nature Savage Raw into your opponent. Uh, he doesn't have to be too worried about it because he knows Malganis will come out as soon as this taunt is dealt with. Um, but you see him, yeah, kind of playing with the lower third this turn, deciding if he wants to block the combo on turn nine. Because uh, the other thing that putting a minion, putting a taunt minion specifically to two health can potentially threaten is that that could now be taken down by the hero attack damage if you use Force of Nature Savage Raw. You can give your hero two attack, that can then take out the taunt, and your entire Savage Raw board will be able to plow through. Um, so that deliberate attack to put the Void Caller to two might have just put Combo into two beers mind. He's going to make the most defensive play possible this turn with the lower third. Yep, just uh, really taking control of the board. I, I, I think that's not a bad play when you've seen that your opponent you know, played Force of Nature last turn, doesn't have things like Ancient of Lore that she'd want to play. Just to lock down the board, lock down any other potential removal spells. We could see a Keeper of the Grove come down here on the Void Caller be really interesting if Eloise decided to uh, maybe read into the Lotheb that he doesn't have a demon and doesn't want the a, sp a removal spell to hit the Void Caller and then decides to hit it for damage if she takes that as some kind of read. That would be pretty risky, though. Yeah, it's interesting because the Lotheb also... It, it feels unnecessarily protective if uh, your opponent has, for example, Malganis in their hand. 
Because um, you know, if, if they have Malganis in their hand, they don't necessarily need to defend against Dying to Force of Nature Savage Raw this turn, because obviously Malganis needs to be dealt with additionally after the taunt. Um, so it will be interesting what she decides to go for here. It's going to be a silence. Doesn't want to deal with any demon at all, can't blame her for that. And we're getting to the point of the game where Malganis is going to be able to be played for just from the hand, you know, hard cast for nine mana, which is a, a much juicier target to big game hunter if they've had to spend nine mana on it. Indeed. So yeah, the silence comes out pretty good. Pretty good idea to uh, get the silence on that void collar, stop the demon coming down. But we might well see a Malganis on turn nine anyway. I wonder. Just as a big threat. Yeah, um, especially especially if you play some if you play something like the boom or the giants here to bait out the big game hunter. Sure, but he, he it seems like he was making a defensive play around combo the turn before. He didn't necessarily need to, as we've mentioned, because of the Malganis. Um, but he might be considering playing around so combo again. Um, generally, once you've played around combo once against Druid, you're almost locked into doing it forever, which is. Um, why sometimes just like making the offensive play and saying they don't have it is the right way so you don't kind of get locked into that defensive mode. Um, but he would love to be able to do something like Molten Giant Heelbot this turn, for example, which is um, both a high pressure play and a defensive play, but he's one mana off from being able to do that. Uh, so it looks like he's going to start with the Life Tap, maybe trying to pick up a Shadow Flame, but with such luck, going to use the Heelbot, goes back to 21, he can trade down the board, so he would be dead to combo this turn. Yeah, that was a very defensive play with the heal bar. I can understand wanting to... I guess what you're defending against with double Savage Roar would be lethal as well, right? Not qu No, not quite. No, no, no. So, double, double Savage Roar wouldn't do it. Um, he's dead. He was dead to combo whether he healed or not. Yeah, so that's, yeah. that's why I'm wondering why he played so defensively. He didn't play something like a, a Mountain Giant. Oh, if he didn't heal, he would have died to double Savage Roar. Sure. Yeah. Um, so you are playing around things. If he didn't heal, he would die just to force of nature. So um, it makes a lot of sense to heal. Um, but he had no play that played around combo specifically. So he's going to get the happy news that there is no combo in his opponent's hand. Yep, Eloise, wild growth to dig here. And there is an Ancient of War. So finally, Eloise starting to draw some of these bombs. It does mean that they are still in her, in her deck. And yeah, you can see an Ancient of Lore. Yeah, they've just come far, far, far too late at this point, and she's been extremely greedy with this shade throughout. Uh, but I think at some point she's going to have to accept that this, this shade might need to be used to control this board. But I guess at this point she views it as her win condition with that one copy of Force of Nature left in her hand. It might just be her win condition to uh, to burst through with the Force of Nature Savage Raw combo, but the, the Taunt Giver being drawn... Uh, that could just be GG, because we can taunt up two Mountain Giants this turn. Yeah, that's... Uh, Three mana that's... Mountain Giant, four mana Mountain Giant, Sun Fury. That is a huge wall of taunt that you have to break through, even with a 7-7 seven -seven already consolidated on the board. Big Game Hunter can, of course, come into play and shoot one of them down, but then that just opens up the Malganis on the following turn to protect oh, him even more. It's not too often you see double Mountain Giant taunted up on the same turn. It's usually double Molten Giant, but uh, right. yeah, the, the maximum value there on the Mountain Giants. Finally, the Shade comes out of hiding. So three drop it gets to trade with a three drop. Uh, That's going to be it, right? Siphon Soul. Will. Hellfire and Owl is lethal. Owl and Hellfire, Owl and Siphon Soul, yeah. Either way, gets the job done. Two beers is going all the way to the final calendar. Wow, this is incredible. What a story. And he's going to meet Sixel, his fellow German, uh, who he's met in local tournaments in Berlin. Sixel was tweeting about just earlier. He's played him in like uh, local fireside gatherings. Oh, really? Because they live in the same city. Mm -hmm. uh, started out in Meltdown with uh, players like Faramir as well. And Two Beers is going all the way to the final. This, this is feeling more and more like the breakout performance. But I have to say, if there's anyone who can put a stop to the momentum of the newcomer, it looks like it's going to be Sixel. That's definitely possible. I just wanted to point out that significantly less of a theatrical reaction to that win than the one against Strife Crow from Two Beers. So it might be that he's starting to slip into his comfort zone a bit more and actually feels more at home. Um, you know, that emotional reaction at Strife Crow kind of gives the impression it's like, it's almost like it's a game I'm not supposed to win, right? If, if I'm that overjoyed about doing it. Um, whereas that one seemed a lot more like business as usual. He just kept calm, collected, uh, played the cards he needed to for lethal, and he's, he's just ready for the final, so... Both of these players looking in pretty good shape. 6-0 with an with a absolute um, stomping of a set against Zelay. And uh, Two Beers getting through uh, his final day pretty comfortably as well. I think 3-1-3-1 has been his result. So pretty comfortable Absolutely. for him as well. 
Well, those players are going to have to wait just a little bit to get into the final because we do have to decide our third place finisher. Uh, $500 for third place and $250 for fourth. So doubling your money if you win this match. It's uh, It does all matter at the end of the day. And that's going to be Zalay versus Eloise. It's going to be coming up in just a few minutes. We're going to take a, a very short break. Uh, so charge your glass, get yourself ready, get some snacks, uh, get yourself comfortable, maybe add an extra pillow, get really comfortable and settled in for the finals of the inaugural HS Arena Invitational. We'll see you back here in a few minutes.